And in today's session, uh, we're going to be doing this first part. So this overall is intro R and intro to the tidyverse in R with RNA seq data. All of the materials are open source here. There you go. Um, so the first session here. Uh, there also in the original Slack message, there was a link to the source code. If you this is all coded in R, including these documents, so you can see how they're made. Now we're going to be following this along pretty closely. So this is meant for either your interview or you can work through this entirely on your own without uh, in the session. So if you get lost or you're having problems with a typo, particularly as the week progresses, you can directly copy and paste from this document. Um, but as well, it's also nice to type it out to get yourself used to some of the you know, auto complete and correction features we're going to show. So there's some background on why we're doing this. Uh, so the first motivation of why why write code, why bother? Um, if anyone has ever had a kind of complicated process in a point and click software that they've tried to tell someone else how to do, you know, it can get very long and they can get very nitpicky of like, okay, in this menu, and then in this sub menu, select this, and then in this third tab, right, it gets really hard. Um, so the great thing about coding is we have a script, which is just a text document with a bit of extra formatting. That means that someone can take it and run exactly the same thing. And since you had to write the script to do it yourself, you're not actually putting that much more effort to maybe add a couple of comments to it, a couple of instructions, and then give it to someone and say, you can do exactly what I did on your own data or practice on the data you use. There's a lot more customization. Um, we're actually going to be using Dark Studio, which is a point and click program. Uh, so it has some point and click things, but additional customizations uh, with the code are only possible with the code. And then if you have, large data sets, you know, laptops are pretty great and pretty powerful now, but not for everything. So one way you can access more resources is things like Amazon and Google or your own high performance uh, server in a lab. And the only way to access them often is through command line because you can't physically go to Amazon and say, hey, I want to work on your server today. Um, you need command line access. And that means you need scripts and code in order to even tell them to a program. We're using R. And for a number of reasons, uh, it's open source and it's free. There's a really large supportive community, particularly among um, biologists and medical research communities. Uh, it has a statistical foundation, which particularly for things like RNA-seq allows us to do some things that are not just specific to the biology part, but allow us to go into the statistical field and really have robust methods uh, founded in statistics. Um, it's super well documented and there are a lot of workflows in particular for biology things like RNA-seq. And there's a lot more than this and I super love R uh, in this room. As you can see my computer, I have a lot of R stickers and we go on and on. Um, I will say it's not the only option. Python is also great if you've heard of that. Julia is also great. I just happen to know R and use R so that's why I'm teaching it. But I in no way means that, you know, if you have a a resource. If everyone in your lab uses Python, you should learn Python. If everyone in your lab uses R, you should learn R because that's the resources and that's what's going to help you in that group. Maybe in future you'll learn the other one and it's actually much easier. Like the second language you learn is always a lot easier. If, uh, I think in speaking languages and in code. We're not going to go super into the data today. This is more for later uh, that because we're only going to load it. We're not going to do much with it. But these data come from a very recent publication uh, looking at uh, tuberculosis infection in human monocytes. And that's all I'm going to say on that right now. There is a GitHub with the actual analysis for the paper out there. And I'm going to close the door. I'm <laughs> very unhappy out there. So there are a couple more slides on the data. Those are for later in the week when we actually talk about what linear model you always will run and why we're looking at the data that we are. But that link is in here in case anyone wants to look at the paper and look at the full analyses that are done with these data. So everyone should have installed R. So wherever you have R and R Studio installed, you're going to want to open R Studio, the one with the circle. I use it a lot, so it's on my quick launch. So that error because it's really deleted the file. If you only end up with this left pane, if you have like a one pane system, that means you're an R, not R Studio. So make sure you're open R Studio. R Studio is a graphical user interface, the GUI for the R programming language. So we have a couple of pieces here. So this left side is R, 
it's where you can, you can just use it as a calculator. I do all the time. And it's the actual coding aspect. Everything else about our studio is kind of is features that add on to R that make our lives a little easier. So we have on the right side, we have an environment pane. So this is where all of our data are going to show up. So when you like load a table or figure or whatever, it'll be listed here by the name you give it. And then you can easily access it as well as easily like delete and load things. There is a history tab. See my two plus two that I did is already in it. Uh, importantly, this is a this is a Hail Mary space. This does save for a while. And if you forgot to save something from your code, you can check to see if it's here. It's not where you should be saving things routinely. There's really a, oh no, what did I do five minutes ago? I forgot to save it. Oh God, I need that line. Then it'll be in here. Um, we can see, you know, I did a lot of math with logs at some point. The other tabs aren't important for this week, um, but really show what R and R Studio are capable of. So connections are things like Git, GitHub. You can do version control and connect to online resources directly in R Studio. For things like this workshop, there's this package called Learn R to create exercises that are interactive, and it can be directly in here. So sometimes there's a Git tab, there's other tabs, um, but really the first two is all we care about in this team for this week. The lower part has a bunch of other useful things. So we have our file explorer. So this looks just like your normal finder, I think I mean that, the finder and file explorer. It'll be in your home directory when you haven't done anything yet. So it's usually like user slash username is where you are. We'll see how this changes when we start adding files and looking in there. We make plots so up here in the plots pane. These aren't saved, it's like temporary memory, but it's a great way to see what you're making before you save it to make sure it's actually what you think it is, um, as well as how big is it gonna be. You don't wanna save you know, a multi panel figure and then have it be one inch by one inch and you can't see anything. Packages, R comes with a ton of package already installed as part of base R. You know, base literally is the package of base R. And you'll see if you actually look at this list, some of these I've installed, they won't be on yours. And we'll add to this and use this pane. We'll see more from the help page. There's something in here right now, we'll see that later. Um, and then just other features that we're not using, but can be helpful in R. If you make an interactive figure, like an HTML, a figure that can zoom or rotate, or a video, it will show up in viewer instead of blocks. These blocks is used for static images, as well as you can make PowerPoint presentations, slide presentations uh, in R and they show up in presentation. We're not going to use them. Really, we'll focus mostly on files and then help. Everyone should have R Studio bin. And you'll see in the upper right, it says project none. That means we're not in a project yet. We're not working on anything yet. You don't have to work in projects to do things to be honest, uh, but I literally do everything in a project because it forces me to immediately be organized and really pushes that everything that you're working on should be contained in the folder within the project. So in order to make a project, you can either use this pane and say new project, or like I very often forget that exists, file, new project. When you do that, you have some options. Uh, if you already have the data downloaded someplace in its own folder that you want to use, you can use an existing directory. Well, in my case, I'm just going to create a brand new one. You'll see on the bottom version control. Uh, we're not doing that. But again, that's an integration with something like Git the version control of your resources, which are actually which is really great. But beyond what we're going to do. So once I hit I want a new folder, it asks what sort of project I want. Uh, we're making a new project. You can write, you write R packages and things like this. You write shiny apps, which are those interactive things. Watch is a whole other new thing. Um, or just create a project. Leave it on my desktop. Um, follow it into R. You can follow it whatever you want, and you can put it wherever you want on your computer. Just make sure you know where you're putting it, that it's not in some sort of hidden folder. So make sure you browse wherever you put it. Um, you know where it is. These options may or may not show up on yours. Uh, this is, again, for version control. Do you want to make it a Git? Um, and then our environment is more reproducible. Really okay. So open, it'll close our studio and reopen. You see, 
looks the same. My two plus two has disappeared because that was not in this project. If we look at our history, there's no history because it's specific to each project. So if you lost something in one project and you're in a different one, you can open the other project to see its history. The one thing that did change, if you were paying super attention, which I didn't not expect necessarily, uh, is this pane files now shows where we are on our computer. We're not on home or in home desktop in the folder that I made with this product. And so what I said, you don't have to work in these, but it's super great because as long as your data and your outputs and your everything are just put this in this folder, you don't have to give file names. I don't have to say users slash dim slash desktop slash intro R and then give the file name. Just very long. Because we're in this, in this folder, R just assumes it's in there. If you put something <coughs> elsewhere, you can tell it a little while back. I can go get something from a remote server that I'm connected and say, you know, hill slash docs. Like, you know, if you go wherever on my computer if I really wanted, but it's just so much faster and reminds you that like if it's not in this folder, should it be? Like if you're putting a really long file back, maybe it should be in this folder, so you don't have to do that. Or maybe it should be on GitHub so that you can access it in multiple projects from the same location. It's also fun. So if you already, if you use an existing directory and your data are already in here, you're good. Um, but if you have not, uh, go to wherever you've downloaded the data and copy that folder and put it inside your wherever it's why you needed to know where that folder was. Copy paste, um, you should have your um, data data zip so you download it originally. But you should have the metadata, which is what we're going to be working with today mostly, as well as these other objects, which are specific to the RNAs. Now you can do that inside of our studio too. Um, but I know most people are more comfortable with their file explorer or finder that you can do with everything. The data should be inside a data folder inside of this project. When that's done, can I get a green check mark slash green post it? So we see in this pane, right, that we can, we could, this is just a file explorer. I can click around again. Our studio is not all about code. It's a lot of point and click too to help, help things out. So you can see our different. We can actually view the file from here and import the data. That's not very reproducible though. Now I'm going to have to tell someone, go to the files thing, click the data folder, right click the metadata file, click import data. We're not going to do that. We're going to write the code to do it instead. So before we do that, let's make a search for a code. So file, new file. You see there's a lot of different things. Another great thing about RStudio is it's actually not R specific. You can write all of these different, you can write a Python script. I write my like Unix shell scripts in R just if I like the default coloring that I have going on in here. Um, Markdown is what the help documents online are written in. But we're just gonna do a simple R script, which at its heart an R script is a text file. It says .r on your computer, but it literally is a text file. We're gonna save it. We see that it automatically opens this morning session. You can name this whatever you want, um, and I will post these after to the GitHub exact file that we're going to be making. So I always date it and name it Live Notes and name it whatever you want. And we see back to our intro R, it appears here. So as part of the setup um, for this workshop, you install packages, but I'm just about, should have already be done, but we'll talk a bit more about like why we do that and what we're doing. Um, so if you have not run this yet, uh, please get it started now um, as I'm talking because it will take a couple minutes. So we want to um, install packages, tidyverse, big one. And GDPL, we won't use these actually until later in the week, but it's all about getting this ready for that. Um, again, 
If you don't want to be typing these, you can just copy and paste the code from the notes online. Um, or feel free to type them out to try this. So get these running if you haven't yet. If you already did this, then you missed it. So the reason we install separate packages is because our, at its core, is actually a really lightweight program. You know, it, our studio maybe took a couple minutes to download, but when you installed R, it was like 30 seconds or less. It's really small. And the reason is because it's at its heart, just a statistical program. And that's all it does. But then people have added on these packages um, to do thousands of other different things. So the Tidyverse is actually many different packages that are used so frequently together that they're packaged together in a universe meta package called Tidyverse, Tidy Data Management. And so when you install this, you gain access to the hundreds of additional commands that are not actually part of R, they're part of this Tidyverse package. And now once you've installed it, you've basically just like done an add-on to R. And there are, like I said, thousands of different add-ons. These ones, um, when you say install packages, come from the comprehensive R archive network, CRAN, everyone just says CRAN. Um, and that's just a repository where it's super well maintained. Everything updates versions. We were just talking earlier today that like with the new M1 ships on Mac, all these packages are breaking. But if they're on CRAN, then they're not breaking because they were ready for it and they were really well resourced. So when if you're curious, you know, about a specific analysis, sometimes just going to CRAN, like CRAN.org, and looking at the list of packages with a keyword, you just look for like RNA, see hundreds of packages, um, as well as you know, Googling will then get you to a tutorial for a package on CRAN. So is it tight versus many different packages, which we'll see more about, and then ggrepel, ggplot is an incredibly popular plotting package, and now there are probably hundreds now of packages that build on that package. They're all open source. They were all, they were often written by people just doing it because they, they needed the code to do this. So once they made it work, they made it public and open source for other people to use. Um, and were nice enough to package it on Grand for us to download and be version controlled and nice. But this is not the only place to get packages. So we also have what's called Bioconductor. And Google Bioconductor on the page, well, under the notes. The Bioconductor is just another repository for packages, maybe not surprisingly, very often associated with biological data analysis and data resources. It is not quite as strict as CRAN. Things don't get updated quite as frequently. Um, they're more lenient um, with rules, which can be good. It means you can have things like a data package where the entire package is just example data. CRAN doesn't really allow that, um, but Bioconductor does. And from here, we get access to, yeah, again, hundreds of more packages. But since Bioconductor is not part of base R and CRAN is you know, kind of the default, we have to in first uh, install a package to be able to install from Bioconductor. A little bit to do this. So it's called Bioc Manager. Um, and I'm not running the lines, but I already have these installed. So if we did this in the, in the pre-workshop set up, we don't need to run them. And then because then I have Bioc Manager, I can use its install function to install the package we're using for this workshop. You'll see this syntax here with the double um, colon. So that's telling it that I am not in base R. Don't assume, you know, don't look for this function in base R, look for it in this Bioc Manager package. This is because I haven't loaded this package. I just installed it. I didn't tell R that I'm using it until I told it, okay, install comes from Bioc Manager. You don't always have to do this double colon. We can actually just load the packages as well. So this is not part of the setup and everyone can do this. So to load a package, you use library. Uh, we say packages all the time, uh, but technically their their real name is libraries uh, that didn't catch on and everyone just said packages. So something like library tidyverse. To run this line of code, you can use the run button. Um, importantly, you do not have to highlight the line. You do not have to have your cursor at the end. You can have it randomly in the center or at the start or at the end or in the middle, you're fine. Um, and when I hit run, it copy pastes it into the console at the bottom where the actual meat of R is down here and it runs that line of code. You can also command shift enter or control shift enter, which is what I will most likely do. 
like a, like a memory twitch um, to run it. So again, man shift enter or control shift enter also runs that line of code, or you can use the run button. If you want to run two lines of code at once, you do have to then you know, select multiple lines or just hit run twice. Yeah. Uh, kind of specific question, but on my accounting packages, I don't have ggplot2 after I load Pettyverse. Interesting. But it has all of the others. It also has Pettyverse 1.3.2. Should I try to Yeah, so yeah, so I don't know. Voice is pick it. So the question is that if it doesn't list all these exact packages, what to do? Uh, I would double check with library ggplot2 and make sure it exists. Because tidyverse is a meta package, you can actually successfully install it, but not actually successfully install everything inside of it. So if library ggplot2 works, then I don't know why it's not in the message. But if it doesn't, then I would install dot packages ggplot2 to make sure that that's in So it's meta package and it's a these listing. These are actually all the packages. Uh, funny enough, Tidyverse actually downloads even more packages than this. Um, but these are the eight that it automatically also loads for you when you do library Tidyverse. Uh, this list is about to include Looper date too, which I'm very excited about. I use that one all the time to deal with dates. And it gives you all your versions. And that really helps reproducibility, not just the version of Tidyverse, but each per package. Because I have loaded Tidyverse with library, if I wanted, say, a ggplot2 function, I do not have to do ggplot2 colon colon then the function. Because I've loaded it, I've pulled R for the entire session of R. Hey, if I give you a function that's in ggplot, then like, use ggplot. Uh, importantly, this happens every time you open R. So if I close R Studio, and reopen it, I have to reload the tidy first. And this is because once you start getting into R, uh, you start downloading a lot of packages. Uh, and some of them are actually trash packages, like you downloaded them once because you thought they would help you with this data thing, and then it never worked out and you just didn't bother to delete them. That's my life. So every time you open R, if you actually loaded every single package you've ever installed, it would just slow it down. So it means that every time you open it, you have a list. And the first thing in your reproducible script should be what packages did you load. Uh, just to test to make sure everyone's packages are working, we also want to test each of the And let me make sure there's no errors. These are silent. So when you run them, it does not give you any messages uh, unless there was an error or a problem. This is most normal packages don't tell you anything. Um, you may see messages like this R package was built on version 4.1 whatever, and you're running 4.1 some other number. Um, usually that doesn't matter. Usually it's just, you know, versions get updated at different times. But if that is happening and your previous code worked great and now it's not, and you're getting a new message that says something about versions, it means you need to update R or update your package so that they play nice again. So importantly, uh, we installed Lima from BioConductor, but once it's downloaded, it functions exactly the same as any frame. You just use library. You don't have to tell it where it originally came from. They all work together the same. So that's packages. I said uh, these lines of code, you don't actually really need to run. Comment them out. And we see things change color. Your default colors may be different. Um, anything that starts with hashtag is a comment, meaning it's not code. So, like if I try to run this line of code, it actually goes all the way down. It prints, you know, I was up here when I hit run, but because these all start with hashes, it knows this isn't code. This isn't, this is a note this is information for the reader, not something I can run. So, when I clicked it, it went all the way down and ran the tidy first again. It goes to the first actual line. So this. It just prints this. This doesn't do anything, and then you get to the actual code at the end. Commenting is basically there can never be too many comments um, for yourself, for other people, your future self. Will one? It's fun to leave yourself little like Easter egg nuggets uh, when you find your code three months later and there's something funny in it. It's nice, <laughs> um, as well as just notes of like 
you know, I thought I could make this faster by doing this thing and future me is going to think the same thing, but it didn't work. So I just have a one line of like, do not try to do X, it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, and then in beautiful public projects, maybe that doesn't get published, but in my own code, I can see it and it helps future me um, as well as maybe helps the future, any other coder in my group who sees, hey, I could make this faster if I, oh, no, I could, never mind. I'm not going to waste my time on that. And so you'll see here, um, and I'll add even more after the workshop with these notes, with more notes about the work thing. Yeah. But here I'm just going to use simple headers to start to organize things. So first thing, we need our data. So R can handle lots of different data types, but at its core, it's tables, matrices, data frames, all the same thing in this case, of just rows of data, columns of different variables, and you do things with them. So the base R, we're not going to actually use the tidyverse for this yet, it's just base R, is read.table. And all our functions have this basic syntax. So there's the function name, and then there's parentheses. And then inside the parentheses are all your different parameters. So what is the file name? Where did the file come from? Um, there's millions of parameters for the different things. Importantly, the function name almost always is going to be a single word or maybe have a period or an underscore. Hyphens are very rare and strongly recommended against uh, by R and not allowed in Tran. And if not, a, if it's not a real function, uh, it will still, this won't run. Yeah, their retable does not exist, uh, but it still looks the same. So this is all about typos and remembering function names, as well as R Studio is here to help. And this doesn't happen in base R. I'm just thinking a little about R Studio. If I start typing this and I stop, it has some help. It says there, here are all of the functions, including things in a loaded package that you could mean. I more often use CSV. These actually get ordered based on your usage uh, as well. Right? Mine's in alphabetical. You can turn on so they're for your usage. I don't have that turned on. New computer. Um, but we're going to use read table. And so tab, you can either click it or if I just hit tab and then got to a point where this was the first thing, tab, and I could hit enter and then call completes, which prevents any typos, which is great. So inside of here, we have a lot of different parameters. So if I hit tab again, and our studio is trying to help me, it starts listing all of the different parameters and information about them. When you mostly know what you're looking for, this is great. But as well, if you want help, question mark, read table. I run this, opens the help page which has been downloaded. You don't need the internet uh, for these to load. They've been downloaded and installed with each of your packages that you have. All of this parameters and options, all of this information is what shows up when I hit the tab up here. It's literally just taking the help page and subsetting it down to different pieces in order to tell well, you want file. Here's the information on file, but you could just go to the help page and look at it too. The reason this part um, in the actual where you're coding is nice is things like file. Some functions use file, some use app, some use file name um, as the name of the parameter, and sometimes you forget. So it's great to hit tab and remind myself, okay, in read.table, it's file, not file name. And I could just hit enter and it's going to be So I tell it where my file is inside of data. I don't have to give the full file path, just data, because I'm inside of my project directory. And again, I'm lazy. I don't want to type out the full file name. Hit tab and select it. So this is where our studio is not a full full fledged kind of computer language where you're only typing and you're only coding. Our studio makes it seem to have completion and some clicking that actually makes it faster than just straight up typing. Um, and better and best thing is it also prevents typos, which are Kind of the number one problem. So, so you run this line, you get a whole mess of stuff in our console. Read table is the simplest, most basic way to read in a table. It assumes absolutely nothing about your data. Doesn't assume that you have column names. Doesn't assume what your delimiter is. So this is 
CSV for comma, but we see it just needs the comma in there. It doesn't assume if anything's a number versus character versus a word versus it assumes that thing. So we have to tell this. A so parameters are separated by comma. So I have to hit comma and then tab. We see here are some other things that might be useful to me. So header. Uh, here again, indicating whether the file has names of variables in its first line. Yes, it does. So I'll set that to true. In R, true, false, a logical, uh, have to be all caps. So if I were to put, you know, true, it immediately pops up with maybe you meant true all caps. Um, that is different than, than the other programming languages. So yes, I meant true. You see, it also changes color. So I like this. Uh, Studio it lets you know, like, oh, I know this is true. I know it's a logical variable. You formatted it correctly. Great. Then we also want to tell it our separator. So it is comma separator. Now we run that. We have our beautifully formatted data, and it's correct. And now I could ask for just, you know, the lib ID, the library ID column, because its name it knows it's the first one. And everything's formatted great. However, we can't do anything with these data. So here in our environment, there's nothing there. We haven't saved them. We've just read it in. So print it to the console, basically. Print it to the file card. We can't use it. So what we do is save it as something. So I call it meta for metadata. Uh, you can call it anything you want. And uh, recommend uh, not calling it anything that's a function name. So that can confuse R. So meta is not a function, but meta dot data is a function. So don't limit that. It can just get confusing uh, for yourself about whether or not it's referencing the data or a function. Um, it's easy to check that of, you know, if you just start typing it and hit tab, there's no information because there's no function. <laughs> or you can give it, you know, names that aren't real words, also probably not a function. So when I run this, you see meta appears in our environment. So that means we can actually do stuff with it and it can be saved in R. We hit the little down arrow and get kind of a gander um, at the data. Uh, when your data get very large, this can be kind of hard to see. So if you also just hit the word, you can see the whole data table. We can also do it, the function. So run U, capital V for U, and then give it the data I want to see. It opens up this tab uh, for you to be able to see. Importantly, if your computer is not super powerful and you have a large data table, do not use U. It will crash R or at very least hang it. Um, and when I mean large, I mean like 4 million rows or something. I mean, really big. Um, unless you have a very, very little box, in which case just never use you know, okay, the time. So this one's very small. You can open it, you can look at it. You see it just has some nice information. There's yeah. nine columns, 20 entries, so rows. You can actually sort in here if you wanted. Um, very interactive, a lot like Excel. And now we have our data. Now, some things about our syntax. We see that this is wrapping around onto another line. This is because I have soft wrap on. Yours may, you may get a scroll bar. It's where it like scrolls onto the other side of the screen. Um, I like soft wrap. And so if you like that as well, if you go to tools, global options, there are a ton of options, including inside of code. I can turn on um, soft wrap R source files. That means that if it runs beyond my screen, it just loops it around to the next line. I like this because I work on my laptop and then I work on a computer screen here, a computer screen at home. I plug in my monitors are different sizes all the time. So I just wanted to loop it around. Additionally, if you want to customize, if you're going to be staring at your computer for eight hours a day, in the data are you know iffy, but some data shows that having a black or a dark background is better for your eyes. If you like that, you can go to appearance and change things. At chaos is actually what I normally work in because it's a bunch of neon colors. Change the colors, change the base font size. 
you can change the actual font, um, you can customize it however you want. I'm not gonna turn any of that on. It's much easier on the screen to have it. Like background. So additionally, this soft wrap happens. Um, and if you don't like that, if you want to always be able to see things, even on the smallest screen, you can use hard returns and functions. As long as you're inside of those parentheses of the function, you can have as many hard returns and spaces as you want. By you know, base R, when I use tab uh, completion, it puts spaces around the equal sign for parameters. You don't have to do that. This, this runs this time. You see it runs both lines, it shows a plus to let you know in the console that this is on two physical lines of code. And this can also be really nice if you version control. Now, if something changes on this line, I'm going to be told it changed on line 15 versus if it changed on this line, I'm going to be told line 16. If I had something that was really, really, really long on line 15 and I changed it like way off my screen, my version control is going to say, oh, line 15 changed. Oh, great. That's a thousand characters. What changed? This is kind of hard versus... I like to, you can't tell, I like to separate things very vertically, but it's all about what you prefer and what is easier for you to read. R is very uh, forgiving. <laughs> Additionally, you don't have to tell it file equals if you know your function really well. So that's where the help page is really helpful. When you see the help page, it lists these in order. That's the default order of parameters. If you use that, you don't have to tell it. So file is the first parameter for the default. Header is the second. Separator is the third. So I'm feeling risky. I can just not tell it what any of my parameters are named. What is that? And it runs. I say this is a bit risky because if you're not familiar with your function very well, don't exactly remember the order. So in all honesty, how I function and how I recommend is you know, often the first thing is, is a file name or a piece of data. So that's kind of a given. That's why I often don't use file equals because it's kind of a given that that's what I'm using. That's what I work on is the data. But for most other parameters, I use them. Just in case. Additionally, there are other functions you see here. Um, we're not going to use them, but if you already knew you were going to load a CSV, you could use read.csv instead of read.table. And now you don't have to tell it the separator is comma because the function assumes, here it assumes that the separator is comma and that that is true. But it does exactly the same thing as read table. It's slightly less time. The data frame. I said R will take lots of different types of data. So another type that's pretty common is R data, aptly named. Um, so R data is just a compressed file of things inside of an environment. So what's nice about it is it's automatically compressed, so it can be smaller than having a bunch of tables, as well as it can be multiple things. You can have a single R data file that actually contains hundreds of tables if you want. <laughs> and so we have one of those. And to load it, we use load data. And I don't want to type everything. So tab. Now I can load this dot zoom, which the name will make more sense later in the week. So if I run that, um, we'll see it's just this one dot object appeared. But it could be many different objects if you if I had saved them. So those are just two common ways to read the data. You can do tab delimited, you can do space delimited tables, you just give read table the correct separator. Um, there's another form you might see, it's called RDS, uh, which is our data system. You probably use it super frequently. I don't think that's actually right. It's R something, which is just another compressed form of data. Um, but I actually can't tell you how it's different from our data because I've never seen anything different. I think the compression is different. So we can work with these data because they're in here. We see this is a complex object. This is why I didn't try to load it with something like read.table um, because it's, you see, it's 
yeah, there's a lot going on in here. We'll explore this more, but it's not a simple single table. So you cannot load this using read.table or read.cc. So that's why I say if this happened, that to make scroll one line of code to actually load an object that then meant the thing. With the, if everyone can clear their check marks slash X's uh, and then re put them up, slash posted it up, if all the data loaded, you can see both that and meta in the environment. Okay, so that we have DAT and meta in our environments. What else do something like that? So everything we're gonna do now is stuff that we will kind of sort of do again in the tidyverse um, on Wednesday, but it is important to think about what happens in base R because sometimes it can be faster as well as just being familiar with when you're doing a really quick just looking at your data. You often don't really want to load the tidyverse and deal with it just to say like how many rows did this data frame have? So how do we have things like that? So some just like useful base R functions that at least I found I use a lot in data exploration, dim for dimensions can ask, you know, how, how big is meta? It always will list rows then columns. We can ask for dim of our that object. Can we see not more rows and um, you can access pieces of these. So, right, a data frame is two dimensional. You have your rows and your columns. The that object is three dimensional. It's called an S3 object, three dimensional. Um, so, you have rows, columns, and then multiple data frames. So to access pieces of things, you use the dollars and syntax. Again, our studio is being helpful in trying to auto-complete. If I say I'm in the metadata of meta table, and I do dollar sign, it gives me all of my different column names. And which column name would you like to look at, please? So like, location ID. All my different patient IDs. And the reason the dollar sign works is because if we look at what is meta, what class of data, are we dealing with here? Um, I said command shift enter, right? Nope. So I don't have to fix that on the video. Uh, command shift enter does not run the code. Command enter runs the code. Command shift enter opens it. I use them so frequently, I forgot. So class meta, just asking what sort of data are these? Saying it's a data frame, which is why this dollar sign works. It works on data frames and it works on these S3 objects. So instead, with that, again, autocomplete is referring. Uh, inside of that, the target's data frame is actually the same as meta. It's the same thing. Um, it is the same thing. So right, if you run these two next to each other, it's exactly the same. Because it's three dimensions, that's why you have to start stringing together multiple dollar signs because I'm in the data object. I have to tell it I'm in the target's data frame of the data with multiple data frames, and then I can tell it with which call I want. Technically, with these sorts of objects, you can have more than three nests. You could nest down a lot farther than that. It's just very rare that you go beyond three or four the data get too large and are really hard to access. As a note and what's in the notes, um, there is also what's called an S4 data type. Um, for our purposes, it acts the same as an S3, only we use an at symbol, um, so at instead of the dollar sign. We're not actually going to work with any of them, and they're pretty rare in terms of um, working in R in the packages, at least that are relevant to these sort of data. So that's all I'm going to say about S4. Um, but it's very clear when you ask for class. It'll tell you this is an E list or just a list, specifically for a lemma. That's why we installed that package. And so Google E list, it can say it's S3. Or if it just said list, the list is S3. Uh, 
use the class to figure out like why would dollar sign um, not be working? So um, these are data frames and then S3. So within a data frame, you have multiple types of data, right? So think about data type. We can just start to do class of literally any piece of meta. So what is patient ID? It's a character, so letters and numbers. What is age? So you can see different sorts of data types. So we see character, letters, and numbers. Um, importantly, R doesn't love when a character starts with a number. So it, it could handle it if your patient ID was like one PT per patient, it can. It's better to do PT1 um, because if you were to ask for it in R and ask for something like one PT, that's when it gets angry. Um, so just if you have something that's a character, best to not start with a number in it if you can avoid it. Then we have things like integer, meaning whole number, no decimal places. Numeric, meaning it has decimal places. You may also in different data, um, and particularly in the tidyverse, see something called double. It is a double um, great work. So specific. So don't remember it. Put it in the notes. Double. It's more. It has more decimal places. And now think of the word. Um, and then logical, which is that uppercase true false binary. Now this is when you have data. You might not want to, you know, a million times over look at class. So a nice function is called str for structure where it just gives you everything. Not recommended if you have 100 poems, unless you really want something very long, um, but it can be nice to see, okay, so those ID is character, here are the values, it also gives you the dimensions, tells you with the data frame, so it kind of is a summary of all of these things. Logical, numeric, And the last thing I'm going to do. Um, so a little bit, a little bit of subsetting data. Again, we're going to do this in the tidyverse as well, but this base syntax can be helpful. Um, you know, subsetting and working with work mm -hmm. This simply, when you use the you know dollar sign, this is just a factor of numbers. Use this factor of numbers. Can ask. Base math about it. What does the mean? That's the for deviation. Okay, we can use R for basic statistics. We'll then use tidyverse later to ask it to do like mean and standard deviation within groups across multiple columns and make it faster than doing mean with six times. Mm -hmm. But any like base stats summary function you can think of is in R, um, and it might just be like a little help function or Google search to figure out that like, you know, it's not average, meet in R as opposed to your mm -hmm. so the average, but same. You can also ask questions about these. So like, when is meta total C greater than 10 million? I see a list by row, see that the 13th row, this is true, for right. example. That is on its own is not that useful, right? You don't want to be counted. Like I just had to you know, count case like, well, one thirteen. What is row thirteen? I don't remember. But the way these come in handy is this sub thing. So if I save this, call this logical vector, and I save it, and the assignment operator, just like we did with meta, I save that, and I see in our data environment we have this logical vector. Not numeric. Logical. There we go. It is a logical logic. 20 long, 20 for each row. Now I can subset my data with this. I can say meta. Or R is always rows, 20 columns. So I want my logical vector for rows. 
Found them. Nothing. I want all my copies. This is a note. This index is all again. Rose. Run that. Inspired. You get just the subset of rows using your original row numbers. Were that just true? So in R, it's all about writing a statement with greater than, or less than, or equal to, or in, or I'll tell you all those. Not worth it. What you get returned for the row you want is true. And if I wanted something you know, really specific, I could say I want. You know, where this is true, and I only want um, that what is the biological sex? You know, just that answer. In the notes, um, you'll see this quick reference. Uh, our statements. And so these are sort of, we're not going to go through all of them and show all of them, but these are the different statements. You've shown the assignment operator. That's how you make something appear in your environment so you can work on it. Um, importantly, you saw inside of functions when I said like file equals. When you tell R, when you tell R something is equals, it's a single. When you ask it, is this equal to, it's a double equals, so we can tell those apart. Um, you can use an exclamation point to make it negative, but it's not equal to, and then sort of logically greater than, greater than, equal to, less than, et cetera. In, so if you have groups A, B, C, and you want to get just A and B, you could say is equal to A or is equal to B. And then in a different statement, the exact same thing, you could just say in A, B, and A. So missing data. Importantly, if you ask, is this data double equal sign and then the letters N A, that's not missing data. It will literally look for the word N A in the data. So if you want missing, it is N A, and if you want missing, it is not information. And you can string multiple things together with and or or with these subsetting like. Uh, you want all your really low and really high sequences. You want is it less than a thousand or greater than ten million? Or potentially your outliers. Sort of thing. So that's what I wanted to cover today. There are some exercises um, to practice, uh, and so really the goal is if you're coming to the later sessions is to be able to load the data and get a little practice with these statements because while we're not going to use base R, these statements of in and less than and greater than are the same statements we use in tidyverse. So we need to use a tidyverse function to then filter them, um, as well as just yeah, get some practice with the syntax and so have complete and all of that. So with that, I'm going to stop it. So the question is about what goes in quotes and what does not. Um, the answer is with base R, if it's an object or a function, so it's like something that R can read, there aren't quotes. Functions don't have quotes. Uh, true, false, it doesn't have quotes because it's like an R understood thing versus if it's something outside of R, like a file name, or you want to like the different conditions are media and MTV, you have to put those in quotes because like R doesn't know what media is, you need to tell us that it's a word. This will get trickier on Wednesday because the tidyverse, uh, one of the reasons we like it is because it circumvents all of that and basically makes it so that almost always there are no quotations because it really wants to avoid those. But in base R, usually if it's like an R, if it's in R, if it's loaded in R, if R needs to read it, no quotation. If you want it to think of it as a word outside of R, then it does need it. But then why did we use the quotation for the separator comma? Uh, yes, that is one of the, the weird parts. So sometimes in base R or tidyverse, uh, when you have something that can mean multiple things, it adds quotation. So when you separate different parameters, you use commas. And so in order to tell it when it's comma separated, you put them in quotations to say, R, this is not me yet saying there's another parameter, use it as a word. So that is a, a good case of the thing that breaks the base rule, um, that if it can mean multiple things, that's like why there's the percent signs around in, because in is a function, so you have to be percent in percent to use it like a question. But it is also one of the most common 
not not even beginner, just all the time. Doesn't work. Put quotations around it. Does that work? Okay, put back ticks around it. Does that work? Okay, no, no. Then use <laughs> parentheses right to literally we check all of them sometimes because base are follows a rule that anyone who writes a package can actually do whatever they want. <laughs>